Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. It's so nice to see so many friends in the audience. Uh, this uh, BRAF is an amazing story. As Dr. Hu said, he has uh, been in the clinic for 20 years trying to bring uh, a drug forward or a different mechanism forward in, into patients and be able to treat them. This, is a, this story, the BRAF story, is very remarkable. It took nine years for when they discovered it was a significant issue in human, in human tumors to be transition it into the pharmacy so it's available for everybody's use today. It's a great testament to all the basic scientists, all the pharmaceutical scientists, and the clinical investigators. So what is BRAF? And why are we interested in it? Well, BRAF is both a family of genes and also the proteins that those genes make. BRAF stands for Rapidly Accelerated Fibrosarcoma. So in 1983, they found and isolated from a mouse retrovirus this gene that when they actually put it into normal rat fibroblasts, it turned those, those normal fibroblasts into cancer. It made them fibrosarcomas. So what they actually did is transform a normal tissue into malignancy by putting that gene in there. So these are, in fact, what you refer to, and when they're mutated, as oncogenes. These are what's responsible for making normal cells cancer cells. And there are three genes. There's ARAF, there's BRAF, there's CRAF. The one that we're going to concentrate most on today is BRAF. And BRAF, the protein, is very important in this critical signaling or growth pathway in cell, cells called the MAT kinase pathway. And in 2002, mutated BRAF was first found in human tumors. And this led to the development of BRAF therapy. So let me inform you a little bit about the MAP, MAP kinase pathway. There are three basic proteins in sequence in this pathway. The first one is RAF, a RAS, and RAS activates RAF, and after RAF is activated, then MEC is activated, and then ERK is activated. And after ERK is activated, it sends a signal into the nucleus for it to divide and form a daughter cell. So with normal signaling for cells to divide, the, the outside cell surface of cells are very complex. They have a lot of complex structures on them, main, mainly proteins, and, and that we refer to as receptors. And so there's a, a growth stimulant, a growth factor in the, in the environment it binds to a receptor on the surface of the, of the cell, the melanoma cell. ERK gets activated. I'm sorry, RAF, RAS gets activated. RAF gets activated. Then MEC gets activated. ERK gets activated. A signal is sent into the nucleus, and the cell divides. But in cancers, RAF is mutated. So in melanoma, about 50% of melanomas have mutations in RAF, about 40% of papillary thyroid carcinomas. In ovarian cancers, colorectal cancers, and prostate cancers. Sure. I'll turn the microphone. <laughs> So what happens when you have mutated BRAF? Well, mutated BRAF doesn't act normally. It's not under the normal controls of growth and development in the body. It just continues to signal the pathway. It's never shut off. So it continues to make daughter cells. It continues to stimulate the production of new cells through the activation of MEC, ERK, and then the a signal into the nucleus. So BRAF mutations in melanoma, they're much more common in younger people than older people. About 
of young people under the age of 30 had BRAF mutations. If you're over 70, only about 25 percent. They're usually melanomas that are located on the trunk and not the extremities. It's superficial spreading in nodular types, not other types like mucosal or acrolytigenous. When you look at the primaries, they have a high number of cells dividing. And usually, if you have metastatic melanoma, but you can't find the primary tumor, they have, uh, which we recall, call occult primaries, they have a high incidence of having BRAF mutations. The two BRAF mutation inhibitors that have been developed, one is vemorafenib, and this is from Genentech Roche. And there is another one, Debrafenib, from GSK, GlaxoSmithKline. Vemorafenib was approved for use in 2011. And we'll just go through the development of Vemorafenib. So Vemorafenib inhibits the mutated BRAF at the 600E position. So normally, when a cell gets stimulated, you have a growth factor that binds to a receptor, and then RAS gets stimulated. The BRAF protein gets stimulated, it sends a signal to MEC, sends a signal to ERK, and then, as you can see, cellular prolifer proliferation occurs within the nucleus. If you go give vemorafenib, it shuts off the signal between BRAF and MEC and shuts off growth within the cell. And once the cellular growth is cut off, they go through in this natural process called apoptosis and they die off. And it's very, very dramatic. The first report of benefit was a phase one trial reported in the New England Journal by Paul Chapman and Keith Flaherty. This was the phase one trial. They eventually found the dose to be 960 milligrams twice a day. And as you can see in this population, these are the patients who had no benefit. These two patients, their tumor grew. All these other patients had substantial shrinkage of their disease. Very dramatic. Nothing like this has ever been seen before in melanoma. And as you can see, the responses are very, very rapid. This is a PET scan, and all these areas, dark areas, are uptake of the PET material in where their melanoma exists. And two weeks later, you don't see any of that uptake. It's absolutely like going into a, a room that's like lighted and shutting off the light switch. It's amazing. And here you can see their pulmonary lesions resolving, hepatic lesions resolving, and bone lesions resolving. Quite dramatic therapy. So after the phase one trial, they did a phase two trial that was called BRIM2. And this was reported at our national meeting. And what they did is they gave everybody the morafinib in 960 milligrams, all patients with BRAF mutated melanoma. And these were the results. Again, very dramatic results. You see this is the group of patients where their disease grew. And this is the group of patients that had benefit. And down here, you can see there was complete remission, disappearance of all disease. And this is progression-free survival. So this is the period of time from when they started the disease to when their disease started progressing. And in this trial, it was 6.7 months. So even though there was dramatic benefit, it didn't sustain itself. About half the people, their disease started growing in about six and a half to seven months. But survival was very impressive. And when this was reported, the median survival had not yet been reached. This is dabrafenib. This is the other BRAF inhibitor. And as you can see in their phase two trial, the results are very similar. 
their median progression-free survival was 6.3 months, very similar to bemirafenib. So I, I think they're very similar drugs in their efficacy. And then they went on to do a phase three trial. So when you do a phase three trial, you're comparing your experimental drug to the best standard of care. In this case, they picked a chemotherapy drug called DTIC. DTIC is a chemotherapy drug that's been around since the 1970s, but has been used as the standard of care model for a lot of clinical trials. So these were the inclusion exclusion criteria. All these patients had no prior treatment. So there was nothing to influence their response to these two drugs. And they were randomized to either DTIC, 50-50 randomization, or to vemurafenib at 960 milligrams BID. But if you were on vemurafenib, your disease, I'm sorry, if you were on DTIC and your disease started progressing, you could switch over to vemurafenib. So that doesn't affect the progression-free survival, but it did have a significant uh, influence on the overall survival. And here are the response rates, quite dramatic difference. You can see in the vemurafenib arm, 48%, and the carbazine arm, only 5.5%. And here are waterfall plots of benefit. You can see how many people out of the population actually benefited. This group didn't. But in DTIC, all these people had no benefit, whereas these did have benefit. Quite dramatic difference in those two plots. And all groups benefited. And this is the progression-free survival. It's very, very significant. In the standard treatment arm, the progression-free survival was 1.6 months. In the vemurafenib arm, it was 5.3 months. Not quite as good as the previous trial, but very similar. So vemurafenib substantially uh, prolonged the disease-free interval in these patients. And here's the survival data, very much in favor of the vemurafenib, but not quite as dramatic as the progression-free survival. And the reason for that is, in the carbazine group, everybody who progressed was able to go on vemurafenib. So that allowed them to live longer. But in spite of that, a definite advantage for vemurafenib. And all groups benefited, doesn't matter whether you're male or woman, what your age was, the extent of your disease, the performance status, the level of your biochemical parameters, or LDH. The adverse effects for vemurafenib are very interesting. The things that most people get are some joint pain, rash, fatigue is very common, photosensitivity, sometimes increase in your liver function tests. But something that's really interesting is that people can develop these very indolent, slow-growing skin cancers called keratoacanthomas and cutaneous squamous cell carcinomas. So you have to be aware of that. So in conclusion, there's substantial benefit for vemurafenib with the 63% decrease in the risk of dying. And it was the single first single drug for melanoma to improve response, progression-free survival, and overall survival compared to standard chemotherapy. And here's another look at the curves. That's the combination of both the BRIM2 and BRIM3 curves, and they are very similar and both substantially better than the uh, DTIC arm. And as you can see, some of these are sustained for a long period of time. And uh, last year at ASCO, they presented the update of this trial. And a year later, they had exactly the same results. Substantial benefit for the vemurafenib versus the decarbazine. This was presented last year. This is the other drug, this is dabrafenib. And that was the same type of trial. I apologize for the slides. 
They randomized patients to dabrafenib or DTIC, and when they progressed, they were able to take dabrafenib. As you this water plot, you can see those that had no benefit from the DTIC, those that had the benefit from the DTIC. With the dabrafenib, substantially different. Very few people had no benefit at all. Large number of people had substantial benefit. Down here are the complete responders. And these are the progression-free survival. Looks almost exactly like the vemurafenib data. And again, every subgroup system had benefit. One thing interesting about uh, dabrafenib and their side effects is pyrexia. About 20% 28% of patients will get fever with this drug. And you can give drug holidays or you can modify the doses, but they're all, they're all manageable. But as you saw, not every patient responded with dabrafenib or vemurafenib. Some patients responded beautifully and then relapsed. Half the patients relapsed within six and a half months. So, there are mechanisms of resistance, and there's patients who, while they're on therapy, become refractory to the drug. And these are some of the uh, possible mechanisms of resistance. You have the RAS, RAF, MEK, and ERK pathways. But you can get mutations in NRAS that would then function independently and maybe go through CRAF to stimulate MEK, to stimulate ERK, to cause growth. Or you can have different BRAF mutations, although those haven't really been found. Or there's another growth pathway called COT that can stimulate MEK. Or this a PI3 AKT mTOR pathway can stimulate growth. So it seems like the common denominator here is MEK. So if we can block MEK in patients who are on vemurafenib or dafravenib, can we salvage patients who are progressing? Can we make both drugs more effective at the outset? Well, let's take a look. So at ASCO in 2011, uh, GSK presented a trial where they, every patients got both the the BRAF inhibitor and they got the MEK inhibitor together. And so, theoretically, what we're doing is RAF gets stimulated, then we block BRAF by dabrafenib, and then we block MEK by their MEK inhibitor, termatinib. And therefore, ERK doesn't get stimulated and the cell dies. So this is hopefully some synergy and to overcome uh, resistance. And this is the, the schema of the study. And as you can see, uh, two arms got combination therapy, just slightly different doses of the MEK inhibitor. One arm just got the BRAF inhibitor. And when they progressed, then they went on to the MEK inhibitor. And here's the group of patients that didn't get prior BRAF, but they got the combination of both BRAF and MEK inhibitor. And you can see how successful it was. This is the group that had no benefit, but this group had substantial benefit. So the combination of BRAF-MEK seemed to be really an excellent combination. But more importantly, uh, these are the patients with prior BRAF, so this is the group that started to progress on the BRAF therapy, and then they were given MEK, and as you can see, you can salvage a significant number of these people when they start growing with the BRAF inhibitor by adding the MEK inhibitor. So that's an effective strategy to overcome resistance, an effective strategy to hopefully get more people into remission and sustain their remissions. And the, this is the duration of patients uh, who did not have prior BRAF but started on the combination. And you can see how many of those people are still on therapy 
significant periods of time in weeks. And this is an example of a woman who had progressed and started the combination of BRAF MEC. So there are other ways, hopefully, to overcome resistance, not only with the MEC inhibitors, but probably by shutting off COT, maybe even getting more effective BRAF inhibitors, blocking this pathway, blocking NRAS. Now we have inhibitors of NRAS. All these are in development. We have ERK inhibitors, which is farthest downstream that we're going to try to block. Those will be coming up very soon. And as you can see, the PI3 kinase, ACT, mTOR pathway have a lot of inhibitors in the pipeline that we'll be able to use. So it's an exciting time, a lot of work to do. So here's where I think we're going. What we're going to do is we're developing new BRAF inhibitors that may be more potent and more selective with fewer toxicities. We're going to do BRAF inhibition with these immune stimulatory drugs, ipilimumab, PD-1, interleukin-2. And the purpose of that is that the immunotherapies take time to work. They don't work immediately. The BRAF inhibitors work right away. So if you can start killing the tumor and transition patients long enough so the immunotherapies will work, it gives you a much better chance of controlling the disease. Also, when you kill tumors with BRAF therapy, the cell products break down into the environment of your body, into the stroma. And that allows many targets for the immune system to see and develop immune responses against them. So it's like an autoimmunization with your own dead tumor cells. And also we're going to do combinations of targeted agents like we looked at. We're going to target the ACT, ERK, mTOR, PI3 kinase, and then combinations of BRAF with chemotherapy. So we have a lot of work to do, and we look forward to being very busy in the future. And I want to thank you very much for your attention. Thanks.